We've got a closer look at Apple and a future that may be closer than you think. Motley Fool Money starts now. I'm Chris Hill. Joining me today, Motley Fool Senior Analyst Jim Gillies. Thanks for being here. Thanks for inviting me. Apple has reportedly told suppliers to scrap pre-existing plans to increase production of the iPhone 14. According to a report in Bloomberg, demand for the new iPhones is not as high as previously anticipated. And on a day when the overall market is up, Jim, shares of Apple are down more than 3% on this report. And I think you and I had the same reaction to this news, which was uh, it made us both smile. It, it, it did. Um, I, I will fully admit my reaction to Apple being down 3 4% this morning on a production cut is, oh no, oh no, how terrible. Um, and I'm, I'm being a little bit facetious, of course, but uh, um, the line from Battlestar Galactica, the reimagined series, is all of this has happened before, all of this will happen again. And I kind of look at it a little bit like that. Like I, we, we have seen um, production shortfalls on prior Apple iPhone models, uh, or maybe the iPad wasn't selling as well as they thought it would. At one point, I remember a couple of quarters where, where they blamed iPads uh, for, for a sales below what some analysts wanted. Uh, and, and the stock gets smacked around. And then you, uh, you take a longer term, say, 15 year look at the, go, go, go look at the, the 15 year stock chart because the iPhone was introduced in uh, 2007. So that's about 15 years. Um, you're going to get one of the prettiest up and to the rights you're ever going to see. And uh, I have uh, very fond, I, I have very fond memories of the fourth quarter of 2018. Uh, you, you may not remember off the top of your head, Chris, but I, I, I wrote a column about this in the last week of 2018, and I called it the column, the 2018, the year no one made money. Because I went through and basically um, uh, interest rates had gone up, so bond prices had gone down. I know interest rates, not, not to the extent we're currently living through. But, uh, bonds went down, stocks went down, uh, gold went down, silver went down, a crypto went down. Uh, and of course, here in Canada, the big news of 2018 was the legalization of, of marijuana. And uh, in 2018, pot stocks went down for Canadians. So, you know, in one of the more, uh, the bigger buy the rumor, sell the news style uh, of investing events. And, and yet in that quarter, in the final quarter of 2018, where Apple suffered a profit warning, a, a slowdown, a production warning, much like this, uh, I just smiled, like you said you were staring at here is the preeminent cash generating story of our generation and it was trading at 10 11 times cash flow now we are not trading fools we are not trading 10 11 times cash flow today we are in fact trading at about 21 times free cash flow um which you know is decent yet also probably not a multi-bagger uh, in short order as it was in 2018 at 10 times cash flow, even today's price of Apple, even today's price is um, still well more than a triple if you were a buyer at the end of 2018, early January 2019, um, which is not bad for the largest publicly traded company in the world to have done in uh, uh, in just over three years. Um, but, uh, you know, it. it Yes, the 14, it sounds like they are going to have less uptake than, than they perhaps thought they were. Okay, um, I'm still willing to bet, and I'm doing so with my own money, uh, I'm willing to bet that five years from now, the number of iPhones they're selling is higher. Five years from now, the amount of cash they're generating from it is higher. Uh, and five years from now, the number of shares outstanding will be lower and the dividend will be higher. So, you know. It's uh, and and the farther it falls, I I'm all flat out stated. I hope Apple four percent's nothing, Chris. I want twenty four percent. Knock Apple to, you know, let's go. Uh, they're still aiming to produce ninety million phones, which is in line with what they produced last year. And you know, and and not that I've seen a lot of this type of commentary this morning. Um, 
But these are the situations where you will get some commentary in the financial media about um, the ripple effect for Apple's suppliers. And whenever I hear that, I just think, and and who do you think is in charge of this relationship? Do you think it's the suppliers, <laughs> or do you think it's the largest company in the world by market cap? Yeah, who, I, I think it's Apple. Yeah, go go back go back to your what is it, the Porter's Five Forces, a competitive analysis from uh, from business school, right? Yeah, the the bargaining power here is not in uh, Apple has it firmly under lock and key. Um. Yeah, so there might be some ripple effects, but again, I, mean, I, I I think this is the this is this is a case of what is your investing mindset. And boy, right now everything is really negative, um, almost crushingly so. Historically, those again, I, I mean, I, the end of twenty eighteen Q four. Again, I write an article in twenty eighteen, the year no one made money. Um, Apple is a quadruple from the buy price you were paying then. Uh, you know, and again, it was a better relative valuation, not saying otherwise. But it is during times when the world sucks, investing-wise, that, um, that you will make your, your, your best investment, historically speaking. Now, look, um, have the rest of your financial life in in, in Ideally, together, you know, if, if if you're running around with 50k in credit card debt, you know, stay out of the investing world. If you know, if you're looking to buy a house, please keep that money nice and safe. And you know, but you know, if if and look, there's some things, you know, Putin's kind of going a little squirrely with his stuff. Uh, you know, I I don't I don't have what's uh, a guy I listen to. Uh, I I don't have a meteorite plan. I don't have a, a specific plan for if something truly um, negative happens. I'm going to deal with that on that day uh, because, you know, I don't care what your emergency fund or how much cash you have set or how much, how you have your financial life set up. If, if Putin launches, you know, uh, a broader war in Europe, you know, we, we will deal with that when it comes, but in the, you know, assuming that the crazy volatile world of the stock market is as it ever has been with alternating periods of despair and euphoria, uh, we are in one of the former right now. We are certainly, the markets are not happy. And um, I'm just going to say, if you've got cash on the sidelines at a time when the markets are not happy, when the, the news is almost overwhelmingly pessimistic, that is a great time to start adding to your investments, even if you're just an index fund investor, you know, drib especially if you've got a free trading account, drib dribble some money into index funds, Find some companies that you know and you, you like, you're willing to hold for five years. Um, I am an Apple shareholder. I have added to Apple many times over the years. Uh, we'll see where I am in terms of uh, how far this goes down. And if I have a window that I'm allowed to trade, maybe I'll add. But it's, it's the, these are the times you want to be an investor, even though it doesn't feel like it. Jim Gillies, always great talking to you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. When we want to talk about the future, we like to check in with industry analysts, but sometimes we like to mix it up and talk with a science fiction writer. That's where the motley part of our show comes in. Ricky Mulvey caught up with Blake Crouch, author of Upgrade, a sci-fi thriller about gene modification that's set in the near future. And while he writes about science fiction, Crouch believes this story is about a future that is actually very, very close. So writing a book takes years. I mean, you've been involved in, in dark matter in some capacity, I believe, since since 2014. So why take the dive into genetic engineering, CRISPR, or in your book, Scythe? Well, what I've been kind of doing lately with my work, kind of realized recently, is, is taking sort of well-worn sci-fi tropes and putting my spin on them. You know, there's been no uh, scarcity of multiverse stories since sci-fi started getting written or time travel stories, which recursion basically is. And the big next one for me seemed to be genetic engineering. Like that's the, what else is more relevant to the times that we're living in, what it means to be human. 
Uh, so that's what I'm looking for when I start thinking about what my next book might be. It's like, what is this big, A, something that the genre may have done, you know, thinks it's done well, and B, what is the emerging tech that is relevant to our lives and our world right now? And nothing seems more relevant to me than the gene modification potential that CRISPR affords us. I mean, in my mind, it, it's straight. It is a phase change for humanity in line with the atom bomb in the internet. Do you see it in a similar way? Is that why it's it's more relevant to you than than most other topics? Not similar. It's. I mean, if the. I mean, unless we end up destroying ourselves with nuclear weapons, which is entirely possible, CRISPR genetic modification, maybe not in our lifetime, but maybe in our lifetime, is the greatest invention of humanity. Period. I mean, there's literally nothing. What's bigger? It's it's wizardry. It's rewriting our own DNA. It's it's magic. You've mentioned in, in other podcasts that you kind of see two paths for for genetic engineering, and your book touches on it. What do you think those two paths are, and how do you how, how do you think we avoid the darker one? Hmm. Uh, we avoid the darker one by talking about it, by making the public aware of it. When this book really started when I was doing some press for Dark Matter and I was on Science Friday and Ira Flato said he had he knew what my next book should be. He was like, had you heard of CRISPR? I'd heard of it, but I, I, I really didn't have a full awareness of what it was. And this would have been back in 2016. I definitely definitely didn't have enough of an awareness to try to just, you know, wing it on sci-fi. And I think that a lot of people still don't really know what it is. I think your average person, like, oh yeah, it's like gene modification. It's like what they do in the movies sometimes. It's like limitless. And I, I think it is like a real responsibility of scientists, of of tastemakers, of entertainers to help educate the public about about this stuff. Because there's such a a distrust from the masses, I think, right now with regards to scientists. I think some of that is the hangover from the way that COVID was rolled out. I understand why it was rolled out that way. I don't think it was a conspiracy. I think it was an evolving situation. People had no idea what was happening and they were at reacting in real time. But the public wants like science to be exact and accurate. And I think there's a little bit of a distrust there. And I think that the public needs to be made aware that this technology exists, that right now we can edit. Um, it's technically illegal. Embryos can be edited right now. It's highly illegal, but that it can happen. This exists. It's already happened. A, a scientist in, in China, I believe, edited embryos to um, essentially be less susceptible to, to getting HIV. Exactly. And I, I think that's... So I, I think successfully, that's and it also weirdly lowers the, the uh, longevity. People aren't sure why, but like, that's the thing. There are all these, like you get, a, you get a, an added benefit, but there's a takeaway. And what these are, we don't know. And it's not one-to-one. -one. It's so unbelievably complicated. You research genetic engineering quite a bit, and it is there is a heaviness with talking about it that, that makes it intimidating. Uh, you worked with a scientist named, named Michael Wiles. From my understanding, he really pushed you to even go further with what CRISPR could do. How did he do that? What were your conversations with him like? I've had science, subject matter experts on all my books, but I've never needed one so much and so involved as with this one because the science isn't like you punch in and out of it. It's on every page. I would send him a red line or oh, sorry, I would send him a manuscript. He would redline it. And what I would basically say is, hey, this is sort of what I want to happen. Because here's the thing, when you're like a writer and you want professional scientists to weigh in your stuff, typically what they do is they try to like pull you back because a lot of, they, they want it to be accurate. They don't want it you to like break the test tubes. But the stuff with CRISPR is so potential laden. I, I, I found the complete opposite was the case here. Dr. Wiles was always like, oh, let's go bigger here. Oh no, I, it could actually do this, this, this. The things I didn't even realize we were doing, like we're already doing. So it was the complete opposite of almost every other experience I've had. You know, there's possibilities where we have tiny pink gorillas. We can change our bone density possibly with with CRISPR. Um, you can even edit genes to have, or essentially to replace painkillers to to edit the sense of pain we feel. That one, I'm, I'm particularly 
that that's the one where I, I see the second order effects being particularly optimistic and dangerous. Yes. What are some of the possibilities right now from CRISPR that we're, we're, we're kind of close to that, that you're excited about that or that you're mixed on? That might be a better way of putting it. Well, I'm really excited about the cancer treatments. I, I think that's hugely exciting. It, it, it's obviously a horrific disease. And if that could be targeted, not through, you know, chemo, which often kills, this, you know, the subjects as much as what we're trying to eradicate, that could be a, a massive win. And it could also be a win that gives the public a comfort level with this technology. Because like, there's still like a huge backlash against like GMOs. There's a real hurdle to overcome. I mean, like we, we can't all even agree to eradicate polio still, apparently. And you're going to sell the public on rewriting their DNA. I mean, the, you can imagine the conspiracy memes that are going to emerge out of this. So I think, I think knocking down cancer would be a huge win. You know, for me, it would be, it would be through epigenetics is my understanding, but it, it, you can affect the way that one experiences pain. Mm -hmm. So the, the clinical application of that would be, you know, hey, let's just, let's say you had a surgery, we're going to make a temporary change to your genome. So, so you don't feel pain. And then that way we don't have to prescribe you, you painkillers. That's right. The, the, the optimistic river of that is that, okay, great, fewer opioids, but there's also this, the, the pessimistic part of my, my mind is, is that now you have a way of making it so people don't feel pain. And, and I, I think there might be second order effects to that, yeah. that we don't know. And, and what we don't know is what scares me about that. So it, when you hear about a lot of these applications, I was wondering if there was one that was sticking in your mind where, where you felt extraordinarily mixed on. I mean, I'm mixed on all of it because the human genome is uh, such a, a miracle of complexity. I mean, it is, it, it's literally adapted over billions of years to combat external stimuli to survive and to work as a system. And it, it would be like us going into an incredibly, be like us going into, I don't know, like the source code of something like Call of Duty and just like changing a few of those, uh, ones and zeros. I mean, it's not like that. It's not actually ones and zeros, but for the, for the metaphor, go with it. And the whole thing just crashes because it's so interconnected and gene systems are not one-to-one. -one. There's not like a pain gene that we can just up or down regulate. It's like 40 or 50 or 800 different gene genes and gene networks all working together to regulate how we experience it. It's the thing that's really holding, I think, us back at this point from truly like mastering genome manipulation is, is really processing power because you need a computer. Like at the same time, we like have a computer that's powerful enough to really game out the, our, our, our genome and, and sort of to map genotype to the way it expresses. I mean, at that point, you'll also have the computing power probably to solve all sorts of other things and probably invent super intelligence. Um, it's going to be like a threshold moment. Well, it's, I think it's not just processing power. It's also stakes. In the case of a lot of CRISPR treatments, you're making a permanent change to one's genome. And so it's, it's not like you get a, you get a, a do over, I think if, if, if you screw up. That's right. Well, there's a couple of layers of, of, of editing and the one that's like really off limits is like embryonic. It's like editing, you know, human zygotes, but that's where like the changes are much easier to make and much more long lasting. To do somatic changes to adults, so like adult specimens, it is really difficult. We're already like well on down the path. Yes, yeah, some things can be changed, but I mean, I've read like terrible sci-fi. We're like, oh, we're using gene modification to change the way our face looks. And like that, that's actually not the way it the way it works. And a lot of times when these experimental like gene therapies are attempted out at the somatic level, there are millions of unintended consequences. Again, just co complexity, complexity. Complexity. We are far more complex than the most advanced quantum annealing processor that exists out there. We're a biological machine, and we, we d definitely don't have the expertise or the understanding to know how each gene system truly expresses in what we see when we're walking around looking at our fellow human beings. You and John Scalzi have something in common when you write about fake meat in the future, and that's that it's never going to taste as good as the real thing. Is that artistic license on your part? Or do you think, do you not imagine a future where let's say a lab grown steak passes the, the meat Turing test, <laughs> the meat Turing test. 
I love that. Um, I don't know. I think it'll all look, maybe it will be proved wrong, but I think it's, it's like the uncanny Valley of taste. You know, I just, it's, it's not going to taste exactly the same. I just feel like it won't. Uh, I don't feel like it's going to be like the matrix where Neo's sitting there and, uh, oh, not Neo, but the, the guy who turns and he's like, oh, I just can't tell. I know it's different, but I, I know it's not real. But it just tastes real. I just don't think that's going to happen, but who knows? Blake Crouch, his day job, he writes philosophical thrillers. His latest book is Upgrade. Thank you for coming on Motley Fool Money. Thanks so much for having me. As always, people on the program may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and the Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against, so don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear. I'm Chris Hill. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow.